my pleasure to introduce to you immediately after the music, our next speaker is Karen Holford, who, as you will know, is the Children and Family Ministries Director at our Trans-European Division. You can read from uh, the CV, uh, her wealth of experience, and I couldn't think of anyone more suited to bring us the main message this evening. Good evening. It's so wonderful to be with you on the start of this special children's symposium. It's really exciting to see so many of you on screen and to see some names that I recognize. So welcome here. And may God bless you for prioritizing the needs of ministering to children. So I hope and pray that you'll learn so many things this weekend that will help you to go back to the children you are caring for in your families, in your churches, and to bring new and fresh ideas and energy into your ministry. This is a really important ministry. I think it's such an important ministry in the church to help our children keep their faith, to find their faith, to learn about God's love, and then to nurture them on that journey through the ups and downs. So right now we are helping navigate children through a post-pandemic world that none of us really as aware of all the implications of that because we haven't been here before. But let's see what we can do because there are things we can do right where we are to help the children. We have an amazing responsibility. We know that in families, families are more effective than churches in transmitting healthy faith to the next generation. So although many of us are ministering in churches, that's really amazing. That is a really super important thing to do. But the families are even more effective and we need to empower them and to pass on faith to those who are in our families in creative and meaningful ways. You know, the everyday opportunities we have to interact spiritually with children have a much greater impact on them than what happens you know, once a week in churches or local schools. And parents, carers that have that close connection with the children are the ones that God has really designated to pass on their faith. But we can all be part of that process. We're all part of the family of God in our churches. We can all play a role in helping children to know they are loved by God and that they can live out an amazing purposeful life with him. And the children's ministry leaders, well, you can do so much. You can help families be aware, along with your family ministry leaders. You can do your Sabbath schools and your children's ministries in ways that inspire their hearts, help them to feel loved and to find their purpose. And God has a method of family faith. And I think when he gave this method to the children of Israel, they weren't in a post-pandemic phase, but they were in a certainly in a, in a wilderness, weren't they? Uh, they were in a post-slavery phase. So they'd gone through their own kind of trauma and bewilderment. And now they were encountering a completely new world to live in um, with some completely new ideas and, and guidance from God. And God said this, and I think this is so powerful for all of us today. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. They have to start with us. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And this is such encouraging, energetic language. Use every bit of your everyday living, waking relationship with your children to pass on your faith in meaningful ways. And then in the New Testament, Jesus comes and gives a commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. This incredible commandment that Jesus said, love the Lord your God. Feel yourself with love from him. Experience all of the love that you can from God. Open your hearts to an ever-increasing outpouring of his love and an understanding of his love. And then pass that on to your neighbors, to those around you, to the children in your family, to the children in your churches. These two things, loving God and loving others, are more important, Jesus says, than the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets need these two pegs of love to hang them in the right place. 
love comes first and then these two things make sense without the love the law and the prophets fall on the floor and they don't have a place in the context so let's unpack the greatest commandment that we hear this can help us to identify the areas in which we can help children to navigate this post-pandemic world they they need our hearts our loving relationships we need to care for their many complex emotions at this time we need to care for their soul nurture their spirit let help them to grow their faith teach them how to pray in simple honest open ways to god to learn that god has forgiven them already to learn about grace about salvation that is there because god loves us and can't wait to be close to us face to face in heaven and forever then their minds help them to wonder to know more about god to understand to reflect on what they're living and what they're learning in the scriptures, to be creative, help them with their strength, help them to make an active response to this love that they are learning about, to the faith that is growing, help them to love others because God loves them. They know they are so loved by God. They are so secure in that. They are free to love others well. And we also need to love ourselves, you know, because God loves us completely. So you, we need to help our children learn to love who they are as well. So this is God's method for sharing faith. And how do we make the best use of our everyday talking, walking, sitting and rising opportunities to nurture children's connection with God? How do we help them to love the Lord, the God, with all of their heart and mind and soul and strength? And what can we do to nurture and strengthen their relationship with God so they will fall in love with him forever? And that will help them to survive the storms of life. It has to start with us. And in Deuteronomy 6, God says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's what he tells the adults. You need to do this first. You need to be filled up with God's love before you can share it with your children. You can only share as much as you have received. We love because he first loved us. So when we fill ourselves up with that love, then we can understand God's love and then we can love God back and share that love onto our children. And we need to make sure that our love for God is ever growing, that we're understanding new facets of his love every single day. That was actually my, my kind of New Year's resolution for this year, that I will keep expanding my understanding of God's love so I can share it with others. And the more we experience God's love and grace, the more effectively we can share that with our children. And through being parented and becoming parents, I learned so much about that, about God's love for me when I parented my own children. And that relationship is so precious. As we parent children, as we care for them, minister to them, we learn how God cares for us and how he, how he loves us. Whatever we do, whoever we are, he is totally in love with us because we are his precious children. So adults who help children to navigate this, this world, this challenging world which we face right now and which will continue to be challenging. We live in a time where change is rapid and from one year to the next, how we live, how we talk, what happens around us changes rapidly. And it's very difficult to learn how to live in a constantly changing environment. But there are some things that we can have wherever we are, whatever is going on around us, whether it's the wilderness, whether it's the post pandemic, we need to have, we can have a growing and learning relationship with Jesus. So when we have that, we can help children as well. Adults working with children need to have close, encouraging and supportive relationships with them. What can we do to come alongside those children to really know them because they're all so different and their journeys through this chaos are all completely different and they need different responses from us at different times how can we show them love and patience and forgiveness when they get troubled and the troubles in their heart make them behave in ways that can be challenging to us how can we nurture their faith in accordance with their needs, their interests, their understandings and gifts, personalize how we help them to grow in faith. And that means we need to come alongside and know them, know what they love, know what excites them, what ticks them off and what makes them tick, 
and understand what their spiritual gifts are, live out positive Christian values and character strengths in our lives so they can see what they look like and we can inspire them by showing them how we live out our values and our character strengths in this crazy world. Often the best times to teach children about God are in the spontaneous teachable moments of their lives. And we need to be aware of the Holy Spirit um, and the Holy Spirit can make us aware, can open our eyes and touch our hearts and say, say this now, make use of this opportunity. Here's, here's a time when you can help them to understand me more, says God. Look for those moments and talk about them together. When we open our hearts to the Holy Spirit, he can speak to us and guide us and say, this is what this child needs right now. Just say it, just look at this. Take the story and unpack it with them. Explore nature and be filled with wonder at God's creation because it's so healthy for them to get out into nature now after all of these worrisome times, to be outside, to enjoy the fresh air, to see God's creativity, to slow down and look at the wonderful details because as they do so, as they see how God cares for the flowers, how God cares them, as Jesus told us in the Sermon on the Mount. We, we can help children to make sense of their life and faith because faith is kind of, a, it's intangible for children. It's something that they can't see, they can't touch. And for some of them, that makes it really difficult for them to understand. We need to help children see that the big pit and his love is the purest our most perfect love in the universe. We can encourage them to see that God is looking for the best possible ways to show us his love every single moment of every single day. How can they be aware, remember that God's love is around them all the time? Remind me of this. One day I was thinking about God's love for me. And I felt it was like a huge uh, snow globe over my head. Just, I know that God's love goes on for infinity, but I just imagined it that I lived in a snow globe and, uh, and God's love was swirling all around me in that. And so I found a little snow globe and put a picture of it in myself and put some heart sprinkles in the water so I can shake it and remind me that God's love is around me all the time. What will help your children to understand that God is around them all the time? Maybe a wristband with a heart on it or a bar where that God is with them, loving them every single moment. When they know that God will always love them and never leave them, they have built their house on a rock and we have helped them to do that. It's really helpful to discuss the spiritual aspects of life and faith with children as they grow, as they're able to learn, so that our faith makes sense to them. So often we just do things in our faith journey or in our lives as Adventist Christians. We don't really explain why we're doing it and what it means. We just take children along and take it for granted that they're making sense of things, but they might not be. Um, when we had communion at church when I was a little girl, I always thought there was a real dead body under those white tablecloths. And no one really explained to me what was going on there and what happened in the mysterious place where the men went through one door and the women went through another and did this service of humility. What was that about? Nobody stopped to explain it to me. So think about what you might need to unpack with your children so that things around them make sense and they understand what is happening there. We can look for God at work in their lives and regularly ask the question, where did you see God today? I know a family that does this every single day in the evening. They ask each other, even the small children, where did you see God today? And, you know, they can say all sorts of things. When, when my friend was really kind, when I saw a butterfly flying in the garden, when mommy gave me a big hug when I was sad. So we can see God at work every single day. And, you know, when we ask that question regularly it shapes our children's perspective when they know they're going to be asked that at the end of the day they are looking all through the day for where God might be and that is such a wonderful thing for children to to be looking for isn't it to say where is God how is he loving you today and when they're more aware of his presence and the way in which he works and that he's always there with them it helps them when things are messy they know God is there with them they know 
God is supporting them and loving them, whatever is happening. And that can help to steady them. When we try and tell them that, oh, just pray and just read the Bible, everything will be all right. Those things are really good, but not everything will be all right. What they need to know is that God will always be with them, no matter what. God will always love them. He will never leave them. And that can be a really helpful steadying um, understanding, no matter what is happening to them. The adults that are inspiring children, when we can live our lives transparently with them, live our faith out transparently, then children can see what a real and imperfect relationship with God looks like, because we go through our own ups and downs. We need to model how that works. And we can do this by uh, praying about our everyday lives alongside our children, the little things that happen here and there, just stopping with them and just praying a sentence of prayer about the things that are going on. We can help our children to listen for God's guidance and explain how we do that. So when we pray, what are we listening for? How do we know God's guidance and help them to listen as well? When we explore our Bible in creative ways and share those ideas with them, it gives them ways to think about the Bible and explore it too. When we help them to find the wonder in the world around us, it sparks their curiosity, their sense of wonder. And when they're filled with wonder, that dissipates anxiety. When they can see how wonderfully God made everything and takes care of everything, they feel safe in that love. We can thank God for his many gifts. All good gifts come from God. And the more gratitude we have, then the, the happier and less anxious our children will also be. Because gratitude and anxiety, we can't have them both at the same time. So gratitude is so positive for our children. When we use our spiritual gifts to strengthen our local church and don't just keep them in a box, that sets a good example for our children. Help them to discover their gifts and use them even small children I have seen have spiritual gifts which they can use to bless those around them. Help them to discover those gifts, whatever they are, how tiny they are, and to use them just as, the, as Naaman's mate did, to share the love of God with others. When we joyfully give back to God and share with others, that is also something that inspires our children. When we take care of God's creation, they love that they're passionate about taking care of their world. And we can be positive role models. Quite often we keep our faith kind of all tucked up inside us. But when we let it show, when we live transparently with our children, talk about our ups and downs with God, how God is leading us, our story of faith with him and these things, it can inspire our children. And they learn from us how to do these things too. You know, we can have distorted ideas about God. You know, children grow up and they might think that God is like some distant father who's busy working in a far off place and he's not really interested in, in his children. Sometimes they might think he's like a disappointed teacher and he's always looking at them going, oh, you could do better. Come on, try harder. Maybe they think that he's like Father Christmas, this big jolly person that will give them exactly what they ask for if they're really good. Maybe they see him as a policeman on the corner looking out for mm, every tiny thing they might do wrong. Or maybe they think he's like a grumpy old man. He's angry, irritable and easily offended. We need to talk to our children and say, so what, how do you understand God? What is God like? Draw a picture of him here or tell me what you think God is like so that we can address any distortions that they might have about who God is and how he relates to them. Because if they think God isn't interested in them, then how will they know to, to take all of their little concerns and worries to him? If they think he's like a disappointed teacher, that can be so discouraging because whatever we do, we can never be perfect. And if they think that God is like a big father Christmas who will give them whatever they ask for if they're really good, well, you know, it's, it's not always good to have what we ask for, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really important for us to check in with our children and young people. How are they seeing God? What does he mean to them? How do we need to adjust the lens to talk with them about any misconceptions and distorted ideas they have and, and help to, to tweak the, the lens and make that picture clearer um, and help them have a clearer picture of a totally loving and gracious God. So unless we ask, we don't know what distortions they have that might be coming in the way of their spiritual relationship and stopping them 
experiencing the fullness of God's love and peace in their hearts that can help them to navigate these choppy waters. So, and we listen to them, what, what are they already thinking and saying about God and faith? What do they tell us about their faith? How do they show their faith and their interest in their body language or their lack of interest? How can we respond to that and nurture them and towards experiencing a loving God? So, so if they have a picture that needs adjusting, tweak it gently, share your own picture of a wonderfully loving God. I love to read Psalm 103, um, which is a beautiful picture for me of God, or the story of the prodigal son, or other similar passages which help them to understand how magnificently loving, accepting, forgiving is our wonderful God. So caring adults help children to navigate this confusing and chaotic and scary world, firstly, by to love God. Um, and very closely connected with that is having loving connections with the children themselves, because they need to have you know, strong loving relationships around them. Children flourish when they know that they are loved. When we treat our children kindly and gently, love casts out fear, when we're warm and affectionate. So the more we can show how much we love them in our words, in our actions, then that helps them to experience our love know that they're loved by us and they're loved by God. And when children are sad and scared or experiencing challenging emotions, it's very important for people to come around them and comfort them, listen to their sadness, to be sad with those who are sad, to be a comforter when they, they are bewildered by the world, when they're anxious, when they're afraid, when things are hard. We all need to have a comforter. And God comforts us, it says in 2 Corinthians, one he comforts us he's a source of all comfort he comforts our sadness so that we can help to comfort others and we can point them to the day when God will wipe away all of our tears it doesn't just say there will be no more tears it says God will wipe away every tear from their eyes his hands will come along wipe away those tears and uh, take them away forever Children also flourish when they have focused one-to-one -one attention from caring adults. And we slow down enough to spend time with them, to listen to them, because then we can find out who they are, what, they, what their hopes and dreams are, what their troubles and worries and fears are. We can come alongside them. And then when we know what they're going through, when we give them our focused attention, we can see where they need extra comfort or love or support in their challenges or some encouragement. So these close relationships we have with the children, when we nurture those, and they know they can come and talk to us about absolutely anything, they also learn they can go and talk to God about absolutely anything. And so these relationships we have around us here in this world are windows into small aspects, small little parts of the amazing love that God has for them. In our love and care, we need to um, take care of children um, and help them forgiveness because often we ask them to to say sorry or to to ask for forgiveness and we we haven't really modeled it they need to learn from us how to do that so when we've caused hurt to a child even unintentionally we need to model a good process of apology we need to ask them for forgiveness we need to repair that relationship well and forgive well and um, I do a whole other seminar on, on helping children learn about forgiveness. But when a, a good apology is an honest apology like this, and it's really good for adults to model this, I am sorry. What I did was wrong. What I did hurt you and God felt that hurt with you. I love you and I don't want to hurt you that way again. Next time I want to do this instead. Please forgive me when you are ready. And what can I do right now to help you feel better, to comfort you? So these are some of the stages in modeling a healthy apology to children, because when we model that to them, they learn how to do that for others. And we can help them follow this process without saying but or becoming defensive. And they can, they can learn to say sorry, to realize that what they did was wrong. They need to understand the hurt they caused 
and that God feels that hurt with us when we are hurt. And um, when we love someone, we don't want to hurt them that way again. We want to learn from this process of forgiveness, apology and reconciliation um, so that we don't make the same mistakes. And that's what love does. It doesn't want to cause the same hurt again. And it has a plan next time. I want to try and do this instead because this will be more loving. Please forgive me when you are ready because instant forgiveness is, is difficult. We can say, yes, if someone kicks me and breaks my leg, I can say, I forgive you, but my leg is gonna hurt for a long time. It might even make me limp for a lifetime. So I can say that they are forgiven, but the hurt may linger in different sorts of ways. And I'll surely be careful, more careful around them the next time I'm near their legs. And what can I do to help you feel better? How can I be part of, of healing this hurt that you have in your life? It's really important that we help children to repair after hurt. When we have hurt children, we can use a humble, honest, loving process of apology and forgiveness. And we need to comfort the pain that we have caused them and to support their healing. Um, it's very important that we help children to repair relationships and that they know relationships are repaired. Because if a child goes to bed at night and they don't feel that a hurt relationship has been repaired, then the memory of that, the feeling of that, when they sleep, it, our memories kind of go into our brain in a certain way. And the memories of not having reconciled relationships cause them anxiety and depression, which is why the Bible says, you know, sort things out before you go to bed. And this research about the effect of unrepaired relationships that um, aren't repaired before bedtime is, has just been discovered. They first did this research on teenagers and they found that teenagers really struggled if relationships weren't repaired before bedtime, leading to quite strong experiences of anxiety and depression. And sometimes we think that, well, they did the wrong thing, they should come and, and repair, they should come and do the repairing. But children and young people, teenagers, they don't really quite know how to do that and we can help them, we can go to them and we can do the repair and make sure that we are connected again so that they feel accepted. It's so important. They don't carry that pain of the broken relationship through the night to cause more permanent pain. And when our children have hurt others, we can also show them how to repair the relationship, how to mend that conflict because it's such an important skill in life. Most people who leave our church leave because of some kind of conflict in the church. And often it's because we and others and they themselves don't know how to repair the conflict. The better we can help our children to resolve their conflicts, to listen to the other side of the story, to talk things through, to find a way forward collaboratively together um, and to heal that hurt, we give them important skills that will help them in life to repair all, uh, lots of different kinds of relationships they will encounter. And that's really important in this wilderness world in which we're living, to help them repair the damage and to, to help others repair the damage with them if others have hurt them, to find these moments of reconciliation. So um, they can learn to listen to the pain of the person they have hurt. And that's a hard thing to do, you know, but when you hear, when you hear it, it's so much harder to hurt them that way again. So they need to be courageous to listen to that, to reflect on what happened, to learn from the situation, then make a sincere apology. And what I really like now is that people are helping children to, to repair relationships is rather than force them to say a very forced, insincere, I'm sorry. I remember being forced to do that a few times in my life and it didn't really mean anything. I wasn't sorry at all. I was just angry and resentful. Um, they're now encouraging children to do an act of restorative kindness for the person they have hurt. And this is really important because when a child does an act of kindness for the one that they have hurt, um, it's good, it teaches that kindness mends relationships. It helps the other person to feel cared for and connected. They feel that something has happened, the forgiveness has led to some um, positive behavior and outcome. And the child that has, has caused the pain also has a sense of, I can do good things too, which is really encouraging for them to understand. Yes, I hurt someone. Yes, I made a mistake, but I can also help to make things better. And that feels good when we do something kind, it always 
feels good in our hearts. We also need to remember that after this pandemic, children have got a lot of difficult emotions running around in their life. And so we need to help them um, deal with those because it's those difficult emotions that make it harder for them to behave the way they really want to behave. When we see a child behaving in ways that we don't think are appropriate um, or we think they're being disobedient, often it's because there is so much hurt inside them. They cannot access their thinking, caring brain. They are so um, in stress, they have adrenaline, cortisol, flowing through their body and brain. They're just so overwhelmed by negative emotions. And what happens then is they, out of that mess that's inside of them, they may do something that hurts another person, and then they get told off um, and punished perhaps, and then they feel even worse about themselves, that adds to the pain that they're managing inside and may cause even more difficult behavior. So recognize a child who is behaving badly as far as we are concerned is often telling us that we are really, they're really, really hurt and they need time to um, sort out those emotions with someone who can listen to them, care for them, um, and talk things through safely so that they can deal with all that pain, experience the comfort, soothe down, and then they can then they can be more ready to access their positive behavior. So we can help children with this. And we need to do that by not just blaming them for what they're doing wrong, but what's going on here? What is fueling that challenging behavior? What is hurting them so badly? This is the only way they can express it. And then we want to encourage them to talk to God, to chat with God. And you might think, well, that's a bit colloquial to chat with God. Jesus taught us how to pray and he gave us the Lord's Prayer. It's short, it says, starts with dear daddy. Um, and he just expresses things in a simple, short way. And when we can help children to know they can just chat to God in their own language, not with some archaic, King James Version, complicated words language. They can just talk to God in the way they would naturally talk to the best parent or friend they could ever imagine. How would they talk to this person about their day? Help them to use their natural language to, to talk about what happened, to talk about their feelings, their fears, and their worries. Um, and just say, God, you know, so this happened today and I'm just, God, what would you do in this situation? What do you like best, God? Just talk to him as if they would talk to a friend. I'm, I've asked for some things to be put in the chat. Bible Reading Fellowship has developed some, um, some sort of sentence starters for children to chat with God and to spark their thinking about God. And I've asked for those to be put in the chat so you can find them. If you can't pick them out of the chat, you can go to um, parentingforfaith.org and search for um, 101 um, Spark or 101 Chat and you'll find the PDFs with all of these ideas in there. And they're really good. They will help you to help children start um, little conversations with God, talking to him or asking questions about him and exploring him in different ways. So how will they talk to the most loving person they know about their day? And how can they then talk to God in that way, using their own natural language? So we can also model this talking to God when we pray, just to press pause in a challenging situation to say, let's pray to God about this. Let's just tell him our needs out loud in a couple of sentences. Here we are, the car won't start. God, please help us. We really want to get home and our car doesn't start. And we know you know all about this. We ask you to help us. Or an ambulance goes by. Father God, we just want to stop now and pray for whoever's in the ambulance and what is happening there. May they feel your love and be with the people who are caring for them. And when they just learn to pray these like arrow prayers to God that are just simple in their language, then that helps them to learn to turn to God whenever they need to, and just pray the prayers that they want to pray. God hears our best prayers, whatever we say. 
and children, when they know that, that is so refreshing for them, so inspiring. They don't have to shape and find all the fancy words because whatever they say, God can hear what they're really trying to say. He hears the thoughts and feelings and he hears the prayers that our children and young people don't have the words for yet. We can just sit in his presence. They can just sit in his presence and say, God, I'm here. Um, I want to feel your arms around me, just hugging me. I don't know what to do and I don't know what to say, but I just know you love me and I want to feel that love. And that is an amazing prayer for them to pray. Quite often when I, I need it, I will just sit in God's lap. I just imagine I'm sitting in God's lap. Um, situations are difficult. I don't know what to say and do all the time. And I just go and sit in God's lap and say, God, hold me. Give me a big hug. Let me feel your heart beating for me. And whenever I'm there and I'm imagining myself in his lap, I can always hear him say something to me. And it's just what I need to hear. It's never critical. Um, it's always caring, positive and nurturing. And it refreshes my heart. And that's my special prayer place with God when I have no idea what to do or what to say. So here are some chat starters um, inspired by some of those, those developed by Parenting for Faith at Bible Reading Fellowship. Tell God what frightens you the most. Tell God the things on your worry list and give them to him. Ask God how he wants to help you with your worries. Tell God what you like doing best. Tell God something that made you laugh today. Tell God what you most love about your family. Ask him what he loves about your family. Tell God about the most beautiful things he made. Ask God what he most enjoys about his creation. Tell God what it feels like when you're sad or lonely. Ask God what makes him sad. Tell God what you like and don't like about school. And these are simple things that help children to have conversations with God that they might not otherwise have because we don't often pray like this. And yet God wants them to sit on his lap and talk to them, talk to him about anything that's on their heart. Um, and that's what builds relationship. That's what lets them know God loves them, cares about every detail of their life and is always there for them. We don't just talk to God, we listen to God too. And we need to model how we listen for God, help our children to understand how we recognize God's voice when we pray. Tell children about the times when God has communicated with us. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I pray, a picture will come into my mind that will help me to understand what to do or give me an idea. Or maybe I'll be reading the Bible and a verse speaks to me in some way and I think, yes, that's just what I need to hear right now. Or maybe someone will come alongside me and say something and I will think, wow, there's, God is in that voice. God is in what is being said there. And how do we help children to understand the different ways that they can listen to God's voice and recognize it? How can they spot those moments in their life to be still, to pause, and just hear God speaking to them? This is something that will help them through their wilderness post-pandemic world to be able to just listen calmly for God's love. Sometimes I just do this by saying, I be still and know that I am God. And I'm just still, and I just read that verse over and over again, be still and know I am God. God is God. I, I'm not God. God is God. Is God. He's, he's doing things that I can't see. He's in charge of situations that to me may look really chaotic, but God can be doing amazing things behind the scenes that we can't see. And I have found that in my life, that uh, when I think that things are going pear-shaped and wobbly, and this isn't going quite how I planned, God can be doing something amazing. And sometimes it takes a while to see the amazing thing God is doing in that quiet and dark place. But I've honestly found in my life, and maybe that's something from being the age that I am, that I can look back on my life now with enough perspective to see how God was putting the pieces together in ways that made no sense um, in, in my mind, but he was slowly putting the pieces of the jigsaw together in my life to put me where I am right now, doing the things that I'm doing at the Trans-European Division. On paper, my CV looks a mess, um, 
but in God's eyes, it was the perfect combination for what he wanted me to do right now. So listening for God, watching for him working, pausing and just saying, I'm just going to be still God and watch what you do is incredibly powerful for our children. So here's the Bible reading fellowship, the parenting for faith with things that you can download, which may also be in the chat if you can access the chat from your device. So one is called 101 questions to ask your kid to spark an interesting conversation about God. And they're really creative questions and 101 ways to start a conversation with God. And they can give you lots of tips to um, help your children have these different sorts of conversations. Something that helps children and us through these troubling times of uh, pandemic or wilderness experiences that people have in their lives is resilience. And how do we develop resilience in children? There's different ways, um, strong relationships, helping them to manage their emotions. Um, but one of the, the key things that research is showing us now is growing their resilience by helping them develop character strengths. The more character strengths they have, it's like the more tools are in the toolbox and the more they develop those skills, it's like those tools are better quality, have sharper blades, are more effective, more efficient. Maybe, maybe they have power devices rather than just handheld devices. And when we know the 24 character strengths, there's many more than that, but there are 24 top character strengths listed at buyacharacter.org. Go and look there. Um, that's a whole different seminar, and I did that last night. And if you go online, you'll be able to search Karen Holford character, and you'll find one of several presentations on character that I've done over the years and access them. And that will help you to understand about these character strengths and what just strengths with children. And they're things like kindness, perseverance, courage, um, caution, humor. Um, creativity, appreciating beauty, spirituality, all sorts of things, self-control. Um, all of these character strengths are valued in cultures around the whole world. So it's really interesting. I believe that when the research identified these 24 character strengths that are valued around the whole world, they're actually the image of God that is on each of our hearts, that, that there is such a consistent pattern in, in, in valuing these character strengths. And actually all these character strengths describe aspects of God and people in the Bible and how they worked. So they, they're so inspiring. When we know the list of these 24 character strengths, we can proactively and have fun exploring these character strengths with children, um, actively helping them develop patience by learning to play the piano or doing a craft activity, maybe even a jigsaw, those things help to teach patience. You're not just playing. When you play football together or, or make dinner together in the kitchen, they are learning teamwork. There are so many ways that we naturally have opportunities to develop children's character in our everyday lives. And when we give them creative and simple opportunities to develop these character strengths, then, then um, they will grow more and more resilient. One of the main things to do is whenever you see a child using one of these 24 character strengths to tell them when you did that, that was a really good choice. The more that we affirm them for making good choices about their character, the stronger their characters will become. So affirm them whenever you see it because a significant adult who affirms a character strength even once can change a child's life. I know this. Because when I was six, I made something in school. You probably did the same thing. You know, there's a, there was a big junk box and we'd all bring junk from home and put it in the box. And the teacher would bring out like glue and feathers and glitter and all sorts of bits of paper and tissue. And we'd be asked to make something. I think we were asked to make a bird. So I made a bird thing and I tried to make it so its wings could move a little bit. And I, I had fun making this bird. And when I finished, someone said to me, Karen, that's really creative. Now, I didn't really know what creative meant. So I said, what's that? What's creative? And they said, well, it's like when you make something, but you want to make it a bit different than everybody else. You want to see if you can do something uh, more challenging. You stretch yourself to see if you can make those wings move the way that they move. I thought, oh, I quite like that, that idea of doing something different to other people and trying something different out. And so I started to try this out. When I made things, when I did things, and when I learned to write, 
Um, I tried in my writing. And today I have written about uh, five or six books based on, on creative ideas. I might not have got developed my creativity. I might not have become that creative if someone had not said when I was six, Karen, that is so creative. And I wanted to be even more creative. And that inspired me. And so I know that one significant adult who affirms a character strength even once can change a child's life. And you never know the effect, the powerful effect that will be. It's such an amazing gift to nurture children's characters. And I love this verse from Ellen White. Every act of life, however unimportant, has its influence in forming the character. These are the tiny everyday things that we have been talking about tonight. These everyday experiences, interactions, caring, understanding, talking about odd things. This everyday walking, uh, rising, eating, walking along the way experience of life that, um, that helps children to develop the, the resources and the resilience to navigate this post-pandemic world. Ellen White says a good character is more precious than worldly possessions and the work of forming it is the noblest in which men and women can engage. So you can do this for every child, young person around you in your life and even the adults around you. We are all developing our characters all the time or we can do. And that work is the noblest we can do. And when we help to shape a character by pointing out what those children are doing well, that is so powerful. That is transformative for us to follow our children's spiritual journey and passions. They can be interested in different things at different times. They will have different feelings and different needs. And as we listen to them and pay attention to these, we can help them to make the best of their flowing interest and passions, whatever it is that they are interested in. So we need to be aware of these, listen to them, and then follow those passions. What are their questions about God? The themes in the conversations that we can pick up on. The Bible stories they go back to because they love. How can we unpack them with them and find new messages there? How can we connect with their emotions and help them to find God in the ups and downs of life? So as we respond to them um, and parent them and disciple them, we need to be aware of their flow and move with it, not kind of impose our flow on them. So as we follow their flow, it can take us into all sorts of interesting places. Maybe they want to lead worship at home or help someone or pause and pray or light a candle, follow their promptings or say, yes, let's do this and, and go with it. Um, I want to tell you this story about a purple flower. There was a little girl who was maybe about three. She was very small. And when they were having prayer time um, in the evening, this little girl said at the end of the prayer, tomorrow, mummy, we have to go and visit Mrs. Jones and we have to take flowers. And mummy was a bit surprised because they didn't know Mrs. Jones that well. She just went to their church. Um, but she thought, OK, well, we'll do this. There's no reason why not. The next morning, um, they went out into the garden to pick some flowers and their garden had all kinds of different color flowers. And this little girl's favorite color was pink. But this little girl went into the garden and every flower she picked was purple. Mummy was a bit surprised by this, but anyway, they took this little bunch of flowers to Mrs. Jones and they knocked on the door. And when they opened the door and Mrs. Jones came to the door, she burst into tears. She said, yesterday, I felt so down and discouraged. She said, yesterday I prayed to God and I said, God, if you really cared for me, care for me, tomorrow you will send someone with purple flowers. And I wonder if God had tried to talk to a few adults about the purple flowers and they weren't listening, but this little child was listening to God. This little child knew Mrs. Jones needed flowers and God wanted her to take them and God particularly wanted purple flowers. So when you follow the children's flow, it's amazing what the spirit is doing with their children. Maybe they want to help at church, be on the music team, be on the audiovisual team, do something with creative arts, tidy up, help with lunches and drinks. Go with their flow, help them to do the things they want to do um, and don't quench their spirit. Maybe they're passionate about a cause, a mission, caring for others, refugees, find a way to do a project um, in your family, in your church, in your 
a Sabbath school class that will capture the, the imagination, the passion of those children and young people and do something practical to make a difference because that will nurture their character, nurture their faith, help them to feel they can make a difference in the world and they can be a channel of God's love into this broken post-pandemic world. If you're a Sabbath school teacher, you might not be there at their bedtime moments. Maybe you can make a list of these questions to share with families and say, you know, when you're putting your child to bed or saying goodnight to your teenager or whatever, choose appropriate questions from this list and word them in a way that, that's age appropriate and relational appropriate for the young person. But these can make some lovely bedtime moments at the end of the day. And you know, this is, this is family worship. Even if we haven't done anything amazing and done all the family worship things we thought we ought to do, these conversations read really anxiety. Where did you see Jesus today? That helps them every day to look out for where Jesus is and to know that he's with them all the time. What made you most sad or happy today? And Romans says, be sad with those who are sad. Find out what has made them sad, comfort them, so they can go to sleep comforted and talk it through with you and not go to bed with all the worries tucked up in their heart. And what made you happy today? Let's celebrate that together. Share the joy, because that will give you insights into your child's mind as well. Perhaps what character strengths did you practice today? And if they're not, wear, not, not sure of those, then say, I saw you doing this today. That was a really good thing you did. I was so proud of you when you made that choice. When your little brother knocked down your tower and you patiently picked up the bricks and took them to another room and put them in, rebuilt your tower in a place where your little brother couldn't break it. That was a very good choice. That showed patience and kindness, perseverance. It showed wisdom and creativity. And that was a good choice. That simple act was full of good choices. And you were really kind to your brother, even though he had messed up your game. So the big questions, how are we growing closer to God? Because in our journey of growing closer to God, um, we can help our children too, especially when we let them see that growth in our lives. And we talk about it, how God is shaping our character and growing us, discipling us to become more like him. What's going on in our lives? How are we growing in our understanding of God all the time? And then sharing that with our children in age appropriate ways, whether they're our children or the children in our Sabbath school class or those that we're ministering to. We can talk about our own spiritual experience and how God is working on us. What are the biggest challenges for this child here and now in this moment? Um, because this moment is the one that matters. And how can I listen to them and help them navigate what they're going through? Because they need us to hear about that so that we can work with them and help them to navigate these choppy waters and grow closer to God. So how can we have an open relationship with the children in the here and now so that we can be part of that process? And how can we help this child, this young person, whoever they are, right here and right now, experience a bigger picture of God's love. So their picture of God's love, like ours, is ever expanding from now into eternity. Thank you so much, Karen. There are so many practical examples there for us to nurture and raise our children. And I really appreciate the way that you picked up the gauntlet and the challenge to talking to us about how to navigate uh, our children in a post-pandemic world. I liked your comparison with uh, the children of Israel post-slavery. Um, I also liked where you talked about um, sharing, uh, passing on to our children, but we can only do uh, pass on what we ourselves have learned and that it's an ongoing process. Um, I liked your practical examples about um, the acts of restorative, restorative kindness. I think that's so important in a world where we know that children can be very cruel to each other. 
Um, and you talked about the, the very real challenge for parents, and this follows on from our mental health, children's mental health week, where in a post-pandemic world, I mean, we're not exactly post-pandemic mm -hmm. yet, uh, but children are going through so many emotions, and I think you gave us a lot, a lot to do, um, a lot of practical examples that we can apply. I particularly like the concept of chatting with God. Um, the chat starters, but also listening to God, because those are practical examples that we as adults can put into place. So thank you very much. It's a very good platform uh, to build on for tomorrow. Father God, we want to thank you for your incredible love. Help us to experience it in greater and greater measure. It is so amazing. It is the, the greatest gift that helps to steady us through whatever we are facing, to know that you always love us and you're always with us and you promise to be there to support us, to give us everything we need. And we thank you that that keeps us so steady. Thank you for the inspiration of all of your character strengths that, that are displayed so wonderfully. And there are so many we don't even have words for and so many aspects of your love that we don't have language for either that we'll spend an eternity discovering. But we pray today that you will pour that love into our hearts. Help us to open our hearts because you're so ready to pour that love in and then help us to pass that love on to those around us and particularly to the children, to channel it to them in ways that they can receive and understand that will inspire them, that will help them to fall in love with you forever because this is the greatest work that we can do as we work with children. So be with us, guide us, inspire us, and keep us strong and creative and understanding of children, of listening to them, of supportive of them, so that we can really reach their hearts and touch them with your love. Through Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And thank you again, Karen. Thank you so much indeed for your ministry and all that you've shared uh, with us last week and this week. It's been an honour to have you here. And I think, as I said earlier, it was most fitting to have the Director for Children, Family and Women's Ministries, I forgot to add last time, uh, to share the, the message with us to, to kick off this symposium. So thank you very much. Uh, and I wish you well. I hope you'll be able to join us for at least some of tomorrow. I know you're extremely busy, so thank you. Okay, everyone, before you go, just a few words about tomorrow. Can I make a plea? Please to try and join us on time. We start off at 9.30, and at 9.40, our devotion is being brought from the U.S., by our Children's Ministries Director from the General Conference, who will be getting getting up at the, dare I say, ungodly hour at 4 a.m. to bring us the message. It will be 20 to 5 in the morning, uh, their time. But she did, she did offer to do this, so I think uh, it, it's appropriate for us to be here. We have a full day tomorrow. Um, we've had to make some minor adjustments, as you heard from Pastor Osei's uh, introduction before he prayed with Sister Francini in the bereavement that has rocked their church. So um, in order for her to attend the service, we have brought her forward. So Sister Francini, who will be covering involving children uh, in mission uh, and developing Christian values in children, her presentations will start at 12.30. So we won't be having a break. So behind your cameras, do have your breakfast and some refreshments. It does mean that we aim to finish by about five o'clock. Um, and then we will have the afternoon devotion from Pastor uh, Alex Amurnik. Um, and then we will have uh, interactive workshops and the presentation to conclude a very important one about the importance of family commitment in growing and nurturing children for the kingdom. Really powerful uh, presentation that I'm, I'm looking for. In fact, I'm looking forward to the whole day. Um, but we do start off tomorrow at 9.30. I think it's also important when we're looking at um, children and how they learn to start off with looking at uh, 
briefly at, at child development and we have a um, psychotherapist uh, that will be bringing us a presentation on that and also telling us about learning styles which is very critical uh, when we think about how we deliver the sabbath school program and then following on fittingly uh, pastor audrey anderson from the ted will be talking to us about the grace link curriculum and how to uh, better apply that that um, and, and so on and so forth. So I think we've got an exciting day ahead and I look forward to seeing all of you. So I bid you a very good night and hope you have a good night's rest as we play you some smoothie, soothing music. Thank you. Jesus, Jesus. 